And so uh, with that, uh, may I introduce uh, Mr. Roger Todd, the director of the Department of Public Transportation. <clears throat> Roger has been leading the bus electrification effort uh, on the island of Bermuda uh, through DPT uh, and brings significant, significant experience both in the transportation space uh, and also uh, in the energy system. <clears throat> Roger's panel will explore the policy and regulatory environment in Bermuda and how that intersects with the clean mobility future. So over to you, Roger. Okay, good day, everyone. EJ, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear. Okay, excellent. Um, I'm glad to be here, excited to be here, and um, happy to be leading this panel on the policy and regulatory aspects, uh, and regulatory actions taken. Um, we have an exciting lineup with us. We have two presenters, which I will introduce shortly, and then we have an additional two panelists. So um, starting off with Ms. Charlene Bodley, uh, is the Sustainable Energy Project Development and Gender Expert with the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, otherwise known as CREE, where her work contributes to the transformation of the energy sector across CARICOM member states. She is primarily responsible for the establishment and operation of the CREE Project Preparation Facility, pairing energy with, her, with other passions. She is also engaged in mainstreaming gender into the center's work ensuring that gender and youth responsive programs are implemented as a critical contribution to the center's operations. So welcome, Ms. Bodley. We also have uh, Mr. Curtis Boudou, who will be um, presenting as well. Uh, Curtis Boudou is an assistant professor at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. He is currently chairman of the electric vehicle work group in CARICOM. Welcome, Mr. Boudou. The two panelists that we have joining uh, this session today is Mr. Denton Williams, um, a longtime friend and colleague of mine. Um, Mr. Williams is the chief executive of the Regulatory Authority of Bermuda with 32 years of experience in the electrical engineering and information technologies industries. Denton's related accomplishments have included the partial electrification of the electric utility fleet vehicles, and his active participation in the consultation process for the development of Bermuda's green and white energy papers. The publication of these documents formed the basis for the regulatory reform of the electricity industry in Bermuda, which was transferred to the regulatory authority of Bermuda, which he leads. And last but not least, we have uh, my colleague, Mr. Chris Spence, Spencer over at the Transport Control Department. He is the acting director for the Transport Control Department, having served in the Bermuda Police Service for 30 years before retiring in 2006. Chris spent 12 of those 30 years as the chief riding and driving instructor for the Bermuda Police Service. So welcome to everyone. And I would like to kick off this, uh, this panel by just noting that the policy informs legislation, which is then regulated by the designated authorities and agencies responsible. So that's interesting to me because uh, if we think of the Motor Car Act, before there was a motor car, there was no need for a Motor Car Act. And so the, the big challenge that we have at times is that technology is often leading legislation and regulation. So this is a very exciting topic because um, you know, we, we have several distinct phases as I see it through this um, implementation of electric vehicles. You have the, the technology which, which evolves and becomes technologically viable. And then you have the implementation and the uptake of that technology, the change initiatives, as well as the regulation and the policies to support the implementation and incentivize that change. So it's, it's um, electric vehicle technology. Those who, who think back 20 plus years will recognize that we had some uh, variety of vehicles that were well-performing and probably satisfied the needs for a small island community like Bermuda, but challenges existed with the availability of those products 
and also the, the regulation and the policies to support the uptake and implementation of this. So it's a very exciting topic. And with that said, I would like to hand over to Ms. Charlene Budley uh, for her presentation. Thank you. Some good morning to everyone. Just making sure that my screen is fully visible. And it is indeed a pleasure to be here this morning. Some very encouraging remarks precede my presentation. Um, today, I, I want to focus a little bit on where we're at in the region and therefore where we should be headed um, and how we should get there. My presentation is very closely tied into a second um, because on a regional level, we, are, we have been doing some work um, in establishing a strategy for accelerating this much needed transformation of our transport sector. And so I shall basically focus on the current situation, um, the pillars of EV policy and regulations, and the opportunity cost of not implementing these. And of course, I think it's necessary for us to understand what CICRI offers to our region, to the Bermuda as a Caribbean country. And so where are we now? Global average for share of, of energy consumption where you release the transport sector is roughly 20%. On screen, you will notice some Caribbean countries, unfortunately, Bermuda is not included. Um, but surely most of the Caribbean countries uh, are above that global average. And so it means that we still record significant energy consumption. Fuel imports still accounts for too much of our GDP across our Caribbean countries. Um, and therefore, we understand that it, it, it is a significant contributor to economic development. And it is very difficult to, to divorce the, the, the transport sector from a broader energy sector. And lastly, we have to admit, um, this is an era of disruption. Um, and, and when we say that it sounds negative, but I think there's so much opportunity in that. It's an era of disruption that is ignited by emerging transport technologies and changing stakeholder requirements. So our populace, um, what they require from, from government agencies, from the private sector at least. Therefore, of course, we're all here to speak about e-mobility. So I, I do take it for granted that we all understand what e-mobility is. Um, and it is a viable solution for our region. But I wanted to, to mention that when we speak of EVs and e-mobility, that it, it is an entire system. It is not simply, um, you know, the concept of using electric powertrain technologies, but it's also the entire concept of communication technologies of connection. So connecting infrastructures, connecting technologies to infrastructures, um, and, and all of that to enable being, enable having that transition of entire fleets. And so we find that while some countries have made some inroads, it is definitely not enough. So some of our regional data suggests that we are not there yet and that there is great potential for us to, to move in that direction. Um, and, and while we may lay some of the, the responsibility on our populace, um, as we've heard in, in, in the opening remarks, policy and other like interventions will be a huge part of that transition. So, so far we see in 36% of, of Caribbean nations, um, there is some sort of clean transport policy that is in development or has been drafted. So this is not even um, policy documents that have been complete or finalized, but at least in development or drafted. And this is not even 50%. Um, in about 43% of our Caribbean nations, um, there are policies related to EVs. 20% of our Caribbean nations have not introduced any level of e-mobility. 
Barbados stands out as uh, an example within the region um, with a few hundred EVs, uh, I think now more than a few hundred, um, doing very well, an example where that transition was really led by the, the private sector, but also a good chance to identify what has worked and what hasn't worked um, and CRE, the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, um, is headquartered in Barbados, and that gives us a, an advantage of, of understanding the market um, and the policies that, that are driving that push to e-mobility. And in the remaining countries, most have less than a dozen electric vehicles in operation. A few pilots here and there, demonstration projects, fleet transition programs, particularly government fleet transition programs as starting points, and other study um, programs collectively, we noticed that that is only present in 50% of our member states. And with um, establishing policy, public awareness is going to be very important in the transition. And again, the data suggests that we have a lot to do in the Caribbean. And, and why is this even important to note? And, and why should we change these figures that I've just presented? Essentially, what is the value proposition? for an e-mobility transition for Bermuda, for any other Caribbean island. Um, and I think the obvious is stated, obvious mitigations of greenhouse gas emissions, our commitments internationally, locally, regionally. So our commitments to the Paris Agreement, our nationally determined contributions, our national targets, national other national commitments. Um, we are continuously speaking through our renewable energy programs, sustainable energy programs, and through the transport sector of the, the dire need to uh, attain energy security and to decrease that dependence on imported fossil fuels. Um, again, the intrinsic link between the transport sector and the energy sector cannot be uh, undermined, and so it is also part of a promotion of diversification of our energy supply. There's also transport efficiency, and with that, I will link it to corporate fuel efficiency. Um, and and a, a big part, I think, that we sort of ignore, um, and, and it's, it's a little more difficult to include in our accounting, our, our economics um, of this entire transition, but there are what I call latent costs. And when we look at the, the health benefits and, and even the cost of continuing with our business as usual, then we're not placing ourselves in a good place. So even as we, um, we contemplate policy uh, changes, the health sector needs to be an important part in that. And on the utility side of things, um, establishing again these synergies, uh, it, it, this, this, this transition can assist utilities to maintain grid stability by optimizing charging for demand response um, and also demand, um, increased demand sales. So very much a big picture, lots of synergies and they cannot be ripped apart. And so in terms of deciding on the pillars for establishing a robust, um, a robust policy and, and accompanying regulation, I'll just focus on three main pillars, and this is really um, the, the these are really the pillars upon which the REVs, which are the regional electric vehicle strategy, um, have been uh, developed. And so the first is transport demand management. So it's not simply we need to ensure that everybody is able to buy an electric vehicle, uh, but it's also part of an entire system. So there's transport demand management. Um, there is connectivity and digitalization, um, which really looks at the, uh, enabling interactions within vehicles, between vehicles, and between vehicles and infrastructure across um, an effective and efficient transport network. And then there is the electrification part, which ties in um, very plainly with technology. However, here we see a lot of um, intervention for policy. So there is the, the interaction among policy instruments, there's com complex political economies, um, electricity production and the energy mix, market dynamics, and supply chains. Now, supply chains is going to be very important. As we transition, um, what happens to our gas stations? You know, these supply chains and, and, and 
how do we support our private sector? How do we support businesses through that transition? And policy is going to be a very key aspect of that. And, and delving in a little more into perhaps where we could start looking at um, various policy um, decisions and how they could come together. Um, of course, incentives and disincentives. So the disincentive to buy what is considered an economic, uh, and, and this is based on upfront cost, of course, but that um, economically viable um, secondhand vehicle uh, instruments that enable financing so that you know, the regular person is able to, to purchase an, an electric vehicle. Um, connecting your network, so policy that would support the utility companies. Um, and, and I have V2V, V2G, V2H, V2B. Um, I would say I summarize as V2X. So essentially, you know, this machine that we, we look at as a power train on wheels um, can do so much and can connect in so many ways. So vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to home, to business, to the grid. Adoption of services and supply chains is where we consider what policy instruments can support our private sector. And we have just a few listed here, battery swapping, after sales service, um, et cetera, even in the case of um, first responders, insurance companies, et cetera. Um, and then I've already mentioned the health aspect, which we tie into the environmental aspect. Um, so emissions, uh, standards for emissions, and you know how do we implement all of that to assist with a uh, successful transition? Um, and I'm, as I near my presentation, I've found that EVs have been considered as a rich man's hobby. And, and one can argue this day after day, uh, in moving to Barbados, I myself had tried to purchase a, uh, a, an electric vehicle. The economics did not work out for me. And it, it simply meant that, you know, we took a deeper dive into why that was not the case. And, and this is really testimony of the fact that policy has to make this move from something that is considered a rich man's hobby to something that every um, citizen every vehicle owner can possibly transition to having an electric vehicle, or at least the majority. And the opportunity cost of not doing that leaves us very susceptible to the vagaries of the international oil market. Um, and, and my main point here is that we will become the dumping ground for ICE vehicles because the rest of the world is moving on with that transition. The rest of the world is um, convinced by the electric mobility um, movement. The policies are being put into place, targets have been set. And if we are not careful in the region, we shall become the dumping ground, unfortunately, for our internal combustion vehicles. Um, and, and we have a number of, at least in, in, in the Eastern Caribbean, we see that the number of vehicles on the road are constantly increasing and, and we have that exacerbated inefficiency in our transport sector. Um, and, and this is possibly, again, because of, of the market dynamics, the low cost of importing a, a used vehicle, a used ICE vehicle, that is. Um, economic resilience, climate resilience, again, through a storm, um, imagine that you have a, a charging system and you have some renewable energy in your mix um, and power is out. Your vehicle can actually now power up your home. And, and just think about how that one machine which initially its purpose is to get us from point a to b but now it has so much capabilities and i'll go back to the point of electrification and connectivity um that this is simply not just a, a machine to move us from a to b but there's so much that it encompasses and it leads us to to higher climate and, and economic resilience and not transitioning will mean that we remain with um very low resi resilience of course i shall not again focus on the health risks from air pollution that speaks for itself. And so policies must lead to affordability. Uh, we need to touch on safety, accessibility, lucrative market segments, health benefits, climate resilience. And in summary, basically the need for a, a regional policy um, can be summarized with this, these four points. 
transfer policies are not as developed as other energy policies within the region. They're not in, incorporated into broader energy policies. Transfer planning is, of course, complex and involves a multi-sectoral approach, a regional focus on reducing energy imports and reducing emissions, and, and the transport sector is evidently a big part of that. And we must prepare the region through policy and planning for emerging transport technologies and models that we may not be left behind. So let me thank you. Oh. Before I say thanks, um, again, you, I was introduced as the project development and gender expert of the CCRI, and CCRI being the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency. An institution of CARICOM, and there, there are lots, lots happening ha at the CICRI that can assist Bermuda and other Caribbean countries with um, their sustainable transport um, transitions. Mainly our project preparation facility, where for now we provide complementary technical assistance and advisory services to projects that um, can show some level of, of sustainable energy transition. And so you could visit us at www.c3.org. And if you want to go to that project preparation site, it is slash PPF to be added to that, that website. Please feel free to reach out to me um, at charlene at c3.org or generally info at c3.org. And please visit our website for further information. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Ms. Bodley, thank you very much. That was, that was an extremely informative presentation. And I think in many ways, a teaser, um, uh, many questions I'm sure will, will follow from that. In the interest of time, what I would like to do is flow into the second presentation and then uh, save as much time as we can for some productive dialogue with the other panelists, as well as um, questions from the audience. So, with that said, we would like to move over to Mr. Curtis Budu. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, Roger, can you please confirm if you could hear me clearly? I can hear you clearly. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I'm assuming you would be, you are seeing my screen as well. Um, again, good morning, everyone. I am excited and delighted to be here and special thanks to the organizers for inviting me to, to this uh, event. Uh, special thanks to my to my colleague Charlene for doing an excellent job in in uh, giving the, the background and context towards uh, a regional electric vehicle strategy. And this morning, this is where or this is the topic I'm going to focus on. I'm going to focus on what we call the REVs or the Regional Electric Vehicle Strategy. And uh, why a regional strategy? Uh, Charlene would have shared some information on that. Uh, but the, the, over, the, the goals of a regional strategy is really to capture the natural synergies uh, among the islands as it relates to our challenges uh, in, in the transportation sector. You would have seen that we would have consumed quite a, a, a large percentage of our imported liquid transportation, liquid imported liquid fuels for the purpose of transportation. Uh, so this is something that needs to be addressed. And um, you would have also seen that there are some member states within, within CARICOM that have advanced as it relates to e-mobility and would have uh, developed national e-mobility policies. And there are some member states who haven't. So a regional policy would provide that impetus, would provide a template for uh, member states, states in CARICOM and the region generally to, to move forward towards policies related towards mobility. So how do you go about uh, developing a regional electric vehicle policy? Well, it's, it, it could be a, a very difficult task. And what is important is to have a regional team. So you must have representatives from uh, the region uh, participating in this development. And, 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 and to do this, we uh, CARICOM Energy would have formed the Electric Vehicle Work Group in 2017. And uh, the membership of the work group came from the key or core areas related to transportation and energy in the region. Uh, we have a few aims, or there were mainly three aims for the Electric Vehicle Work Group. 
I will summarize all three of them and say that our, our goal was to electrify transportation in the region. So we have a group of persons that represent the electric vehicle work group. And um, we needed to engage the stakeholders from the region. To do, to do that, we needed to connect with the different member states and the sectors that involve or, or, or revolve around transportation, which is mainly energy, of course, transportation, sometimes tourism. Uh, to do this in 2018, the Electric Vehicle Work Group wit, um, wit partnered with a, with, with, with a few uh, developmental entities in the region. We had a technology expo in Barbados, and this was in 2018. I believe we had over 60 participants from the region uh, Bermuda, of course, was represented there as well. And um, the goal was to bring all these stakeholders together to look at developing this regional roadmap or this regional EV strategy. And as I mentioned, you know, the, the, it was, what was essential for the stakeholder meeting was to ensure that all the, the sectors are covered we have representations from all the relevant sectors as it relates to transportation and e-mobility. So the group of all these stakeholders from all these different sectors came together and we presented solutions or we came up with solutions through a, what, what is called a co-creative innovative process. So a lot of group work. And uh, we looked at innovative financing. So we came up with some innovative financing that we felt were, was applicable for the region. Of course, we looked at training. It's an important aspect of, training is an important aspect for the region. We, uh, we don't have the large manufacturers present in the region. And when you don't have them present in the region, you don't have that support. So it's important to you, for you to have localized, trained and specialized persons, especially when it, as it relates the new technologies. There's a natural harmony when you incorporate EVs in the electric grid and you could utilize that harmony for resilience. And, and, and Charlene did touch on that. And of course, we looked at as a group, how could we offer incentives for EVs, especially at the critical initial stages where we want a mass adoption or an increased adoption of electric vehicles in the region. So the, we, it was an assembly of the key, period, the key regional players that started the, the REVs or the Regional Electric Vehicle Strategy. The idea came from CARICOM Energy who convened the Electric Vehicle Work Group and the CCRE provided that implementation muscle to complete the, or, or, or implement the, the REVs, the final strategy. Uh, just for, for your knowledge on an update on the REVs, um, we expect the document or the, the, the REVs to be publicly available uh, in probably a few weeks' time. Uh, the document was out for public consultation, so we did have public consultation. We also had a private sector uh, consultation, and um, the document is uh, almost in its final form. You could see uh, a draft framework of the document presented on the CCRI's website. So let me see if I, I, I could try my best to explain the REVs for you. Charlene as well uh, gave a hint of, of, of what it's all about. I could probably start with the philosophy on why the REVs, why the design. So there's a disruption going on in energy. And I like to use the treaties to, to characterize that disruption. Uh, decarbonization, um, decarbonization, decentralization, and digitization. So those are the three Gs, the three Ds, sorry, that is causing disruption in the energy sector. The transportation sector is coupled, highly coupled because of EVs with the power sector. And the 3D disruption that's ongoing in the energy or power sector is coming onto the transportation sector. And the REVS was designed using three strategic imperatives, which, we, which are innovation, intelligence, 
and electrification. And the goal is to use these three imperatives to harness the disruption that is currently undergoing or ongoing in the transportation sector. And this disruption would be harnessed using, or, or we would focus on the areas I have listed here, policy, technology, capacity development, and financing. So we looked at all these areas as it relates to innovation, intelligence, and electrification to ensure that the region is ready for the electrification of transportation and is ready to absorb the natural synergy and benefits that, 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 that you could derive from the close relationship between energy and transportation. And that's really the, the philosophy of the RELS. In its form, it is meant for any member state to look at this regional policy and use it as a starting point or a template to develop a national e-mobility policy. And, and that is, is one of the core region, uh, goals of the RELS. Now, I, I will be honest and, and say to you, the, the REVS was never designed, um, particularly for the, for the ongoing pandemic that we are currently in, nor was it designed for the post-pandemic um, situation that we would face. However, it's a robust, um, it's a robust policy. And throughout this pandemic period, we would have, and especially for the islands and, and, and a lot of the member states here, we would have seen low economic growth. Tourism is a major part of our uh, uh, sector and GDP, and tourism has had a major effect uh, due to the pandemic, and we expect um, post pandemic as well. In this current low economic growth in the region, it's highly unlikely private individuals will be choose to purchase vehicles at this time. And this, is, this has nothing to do with EVs. It's just a general consideration that if you are in a low economic growth scenario, you, you will delay purchasing of vehicles. So we have these challenges, but within these challenges, there are opportunities. Because of the pandemic, we have seen a greater demand for delivery services. And we in the Caribbean, we are, we are service-centered, meaning um, a major part of our sectors are uh, in the service sector. And there has been an increase or a, a need for greater delivery service. And this, and this will, and, and by all indications, this will be the case post-pandemic as well. There is an opportunity for businesses to reduce their transportation costs. Again, we have more delivery services coming on and there is an opportunity there as well, using EV technologies to, 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 to look at that. And of course, every country in the region has international commitments as it relates to climate change. Whereas, not, all, not every country would have explicitly expressed commitments in the transportation sector, but they would have mentioned transportation sector in at least the, the first version of the NDC as an area of focus. So what's the way forward post-pandemic? And how can electric vehicles help? Well, I want to propose a concentration on fleet and public transportation. And the reason being, in this low economic growth, it's very difficult to, to, to expect private transportation to, 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 to develop or continue. And um, Charlene mentioned, or she, she, she did say that as, as it stands, electric vehicles are, are, this, are more expensive than ICE vehicles. But electric vehicles, don't necessarily, the, the, the benefit from EVs is not necessarily seen from the low income sector or the low income portion of our society. And that is, is not related to electric vehicles alone. I mean, not everyone could afford to own a car, right? So there should be a focus on public transportation and congratulations to, to the government of Bermuda and stakeholders in focusing on public transportation. Because by you focusing on public transportation, you bring the health benefits of EVs to the entire sector, to the entire society, all the way down to, to those in the low income who are most affected by um, emissions as it relates to uh, partic particulate emissions and pollution. 
we, we have to support the business sector. And as I said, it, we should focus on public transportation and fleets. There's that incremental cost that we have to look at financing, the difference in cost between an ICE vehicle and an EV. Of course, it's great if you could uh, provide special financing for the entire cost of the EV, but I am cognizant of the, the difficult economic times we are in. So perhaps we could focus on that difference or that incremental cost. And of course, you benefit from the energy efficiency gains of EV that uh, electric vehicle is three times more efficient generally than an ICE vehicle. So to move from point A to point B costs you less fuel. More efficiency means you, um, it, 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 it's a more economic choice if you could absorb that higher upfront cost. And we get to, to open up opportunities in our, what, what I call green jobs or green opportunities. The REVS is a holistic approach towards um, electrification of transportation. Um, the EV work group has existed since 2017 and I have been fortunate to uh, have the opportunity to, to connect with stakeholders throughout the region. And this year is a collection of um, areas that would have been identified by me or I would have seen myself that we require to focus on. So you could take the REVs and adopt it na nationally, but it's, it's important to have a holistic approach towards any policy related to EVs. Of course, there must be incentives to help with the upfront and the higher costs that you would have to absorb. But I have seen a great value in having some sort of leadership and coordination, dedicated leadership and coordination from perhaps a government ministry as it relates to e-mobility. And you could take a page out of Jamaica. Jamaica convened an EV council earlier this year where they brought together all the stakeholders in this EV council. So they have developed a coordinating body. Uh, of course, as I mentioned, there's a need for special financing. But when you roll out any EV policy, at inception, you need to incorporate upskilling and job creation. Get your local TVT or tech voc institution involved in the policy. Let them support the drive towards e-mobility. Let them provide the trained technicians to implement a successful e-mobility strategy. And don't look at e-mobility and transportation in isolation. It needs to be it needs to be carefully coupled with energy and it needs to even be carefully coupled with tourism. So there should be a long-term planning of these three major sectors. Uh, this concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, that's excellent. Thank you, uh, Mr. Boudou. And I, I know and I've also uh, been an advocate for focusing on the fleet and public transportation, the level of exposure that we can achieve um, for the technology to our people um, and the, the ability to manage and learn from those fleet operations is, is invaluable. So thank you very much. Um, I'm mindful that we have only 10 minutes and I wanna respect the lunch break at 1230. Uh, and I also want to uh, hear from our our panelists, um, because they sit in very unique positions uh, within the Bermuda environment. And in the context of, of this, uh, these presentations, we've heard from Ms. Bodley and, and Mr. Boudou about um, the cohesiveness and the collaboration that we're seeing around regulation and policy setting uh, within the Caribbean region. So my question is to Mr. Denton Williams, who, who is the CEO for the regular, Bermuda Regulatory Authority. What role does the regulatory authority play currently in the decarbonization or electrification of transportation in Bermuda? And how do you see that role growing or expanding um, to support this electrification initiative? Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for that question, Roger. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay, perfect. So, uh, yeah, I think the best way to describe the regulatory authority's role is that we're potentially an accelerant. Uh, electric vehicles will happen with or without the regulatory authority, but there are certain obstacles and considerations that I think the 
RA has a unique um, ability to address and um, bring to the fore. One of those is um, the ability for there to be a competitive retailing market so that if someone wishes to sell charging services, um, one of like a kilowatt hour basis, um, that currently is restricted to one entity right now. The RA has given consideration to potentially liberalizing the uh, retail market for electric vehicle charging, more to come on that. Uh, but in, in theory, that would allow independent operators to be able to sell the services to the public. Uh, we have also thought about how people may actually use their vehicles and how it would impact the grid. So if you think of your traditional uh, pre-pandemic model of transportation, people would uh, drive to work as an example and then come back home. In, and in that scenario, if everyone was charging from home and they all connected to the grid at six o'clock, you could start seeing problems in, in neighborhoods with uh, transformers failing, et cetera. Um, so we have to be smart about that and figure out what's the appropriate incentive, such as time of use, whether it's an economic time of use or it's a behavioral modification time of use tariff to encourage people to use their vehicles or charge their vehicles at the right time and even do it um, digitally so that the vehicles themselves, once we put um, saddle on standards, can automatically engage their charging. Um, the RA has also looked into B2X. Thank you, Charlie, for, for mentioning that B2X. And we have identified that the lowest hanging fruit right now is B2H, so vehicle to home. A lot of the vehicles are coming uh, with the capability of exporting their power. And Bermuda, just like most islands in the Atlantic, is subject to uh, severe uh, hurricanes and also winter storms. And while we have an excellent response team from the utility, typically the, the average return of service is several days. So imagine a scenario where you're out of power and you can plug your vehicle into your house just as you normally would, but instead it's powering your home. Uh, average kilowatt, I think battery packs come in at around 80 kilowatt hours um, and an average household uses 20 to 30 kilowatt hours per day. So you have two to three um, days worth of energy in your vehicle. You can readily uh, hop in the vehicle and drive down the road and recharge it and come right back to your house. So the inconvenience to you from, from uh, impact from a, a storm suddenly changes because you can keep your critical services running. And that's, that's if you're using everything, not using just select things. So we think vehicle to home is the first stop. Um, it's the low hanging fruit, uh, but it's not gonna be easy. Technically there's nothing stopping anyone from doing it today. But what we'd like to do is to provide guidance and work with the Department of Planning so that we can um, provide the appropriate um, you know, guidelines for people to do that. Other things that we do think about, but we don't only think about our world, are the uh, local air emissions. We've seen that from the work that Denner's done. They've done a fantastic job on that. And we do know that as a result of that, the PM 2.5 particles, which are the smallest particles, um, or less than 2.5s, are the most damaging to human health. And they are almost exclusively emitted by um, vehicles. It's not power station. Power station tends to be around PM10. So 2.5 is the one that's gonna get large in your lungs. It's gonna be the one that uh, causes asthma, et cetera. So, you know, we're looking at more than just the benefits of uh, grid stability and, and, and storm resilience and climate change. We're also looking at human health improvements over the long term. So we're, we're very supportive of it. I know we're, we have a, a little bit of time, but the RA is actively thinking about it. We are very receptive to, to feedback and ideas on ways to reshape uh, policy. Uh, we do write our own statutory instruments as well. So we do create some legislation of, of a form and we do give our input back to uh, the, the government on what we think are appropriate steps. So we're very receptive. We're mostly ears in this session so that we can hear everyone's input and thoughts. Um, but certainly we are supportive and uh, we'll definitely be bringing uh, recommendations as well to help implement a transition. There's one other thing I wanted to note. I'm not sure if everyone's quite aware of it, but 
it was recently projected, I think last year, that the tipping point for the typical uh, gasoline retailer in the United States is a 10% reduction in sales. You know, uh, a significant transition uh, to electricity, if that's similar to Bermuda, if it follows a similar profile, you could rapidly see a change in availability or affordability of fuel prices. So you, we may need to be prepared to transition faster than just a, a really gradual approach because it may accelerate, demand may go through the roof, and we have to be able to, to meet that. And in all senses, electricity, sales, support, et cetera. And I think I'll stop there from, in the interest of time. Denton, thank you for that excellent commentary. Um, I, I think everyone has been enlightened by what the RA is, is up to and certainly your appetite and support and interest uh, in moving forward with this is greatly appreciated. I, I think some of the elements that the RA is contemplating is, is probably um, aspects that the, the average person may not have, have considered. And certainly that's, that's encouraging to know that the, the RA is very forward looking in that respect. So thank you. Um, I also noted that um, in, in my recent travels that in, throughout the UK, a lot of the large fuel suppliers are, are very much putting their renewable energy and, and uh, green energy footprint forward uh, in, in their marketing, in their promotions. And, and there's certainly, while they may have uh, needed some time to contemplate how they're going to make the transition, I think... The fact that they are and, and must make the transition is becoming more and more evident to, to the uh, retailers. Okay, um, I have a question, a wrap-up question for uh, our Acting Director at Transport Control Department, uh, Mr. Chris Spencer. Um, does Bermuda have a formalized or associate relationship with the Caribbean community for evolving policy and regulation in the transportation sector. I, I know that Bermuda is quite unique in terms of our uh, vehicle types and road sizes and, and some of the specifics, but there are also a lot of commonalities. And as I'm hearing from our presenters earlier, there's a lot of cohesive work that is happening on regulation and policy and direction within the CARICOM and the Caribbean region. Um, do we have a relationship and could we benefit from a, a more formal relationship in that respect? Morning. Thanks, Roger. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, at the moment, there is no formal, uh, no formal arrangement. Um, I understand that a meeting took place in 2018 and uh, the presenter, the um, Curtis said that Bermuda was represented. Um, I'm not too sure which entity was at that forum, but it, I, I don't think anyone from the Transport Control Department was, was present. And I would have liked to have been there. So I'm just throwing it out if they have another um, symposium, I, I would ac readily accept an invitation because there are some common some commonalities. Um, at the moment, um, we are, are, are working alone, we're standing alone. And it doesn't make sense for us to be as similar as we are to our sisters and in, the, in the Caribbean. If we can all work together, I think that we can get to the promised land a little faster. Um, currently, we have 601 um, electric vehicles on our roads. And I think that one of the issues that was raised by the minister is that we have restrictions and those restrictions, unfortunately, are preventing some vehicles from being imported. And when he alluded to the fact that we are looking at legislation, for example, we have a Nis Nissan Leaf that is currently on the island in its original state, but because it grew, it outgrew Bermuda. So one of the uh, one of the aims of us of, of looking at legislation locally would be to be a bit more inclusive and allow more vehicles to come um, into the island, electric vehicles, um, that is. But at the moment, no, we don't have a formal, um, I believe Bermuda is an associate member of, of CARICOM and that, that perhaps is one of the, the stumbling blocks, but we're all sharing the same ideas and goals. I, I, I believe that 
um, we will be better served if, if we all uh, form a team and, and we work together. Excellent, thank you for that. Um, I didn't know we had reached as high as 601, so I'm very encouraged by that. Um, and also that that is the purpose of this forum. That is the purpose of these six conversations, if you like, that we wanted to have today. And we're, we're very grateful for our, our regional experts who have been able to join us. And it is certainly our hope that relationships will be formed and uh, exposure to contacts today that will allow uh, different agencies or even uh, individuals and entrepreneurs to continue this conversation beyond today and to, to make connections and build on the successes uh, that and, and overcome some of the challenges that other jurisdictions have already overcome. So with that said, I would like to extend a, a heartfelt thank you to Miss um, Bodley, to Mr. Boodoo, Mr. Williams and Mr. Spencer. That concludes this session, EJ. Thank you very much, Roger. And I'll add my thanks uh, to the panelists and all of the uh, participants uh, from this morning. Um, we very much appreciate